expertise and, and perspectives. So um, with that, I would give the floor to Hans. Okay, thanks a lot to everyone who have been involved in organizing this, I think, extremely important, extremely heavy, uh, terrifying, in a sense, a subject that we will, will approach. And one of the things that I, I like with having such a, a serious topic is that you are not expected to begin with a joke. So <laughs> I, I will, in, sorry, no, that was only in the... In the ears of the of the listeners uh, so I will instead give give uh, just three topics or, or three responses to, to the prompts that that uh, that Attila sent to us before and, and the first one is about democracy and effectiveness in in policy making and here I think it is important in particular for the Swedish context to remember that democracy is often making policy making more effective it is not a decreasing effectiveness in particular when we are talking about foreign policy making i believe that the very problematic situation that sweden has ended up with uh, with several countries blocking its entrance into into nato and it's no question that sweden's nation or sweden's state want to enter into nato that's a situation that could have been avoided with having a more democratic process in the beginning that would have meant having more more time for 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 the preparations it would have been a deeper discussion a more, more bottom-up discussion and, and so on. So this idea that there is a trade-off between effectiveness in, in security policy making and democracy on the one hand, that you need to sacrifice one, is I think not true. Uh, you will have better effectiveness if you have more democracy, at the national level at least. And uh, that would be my, my first point. Mm. The second is about the location and, and the broader uh, site in which it's relevant to speak about democracy. And I think that democracy does not stop at a national border. It is something that can extend beyond a border. Democracy is something that we can make whenever we are disagreeing with other people or whenever we are heavily affecting other people's lives. And sometimes we are, we are failing uh, to, to achieve democracy in exactly those, uh, those contexts. And that can include international relations. When we are using this frame and saying that we can think about democracy in relation to what Turkey is doing to Sweden right now or what Hungary is doing to Sweden right now. And, and even I think that was one of, one of your background uh, explanations for your questions in the letter that, that, that we had, that we can evaluate how democratic it is for Turkey to suddenly uh, change position and so to say trick Sweden into a very dangerous situation where it has revealed its preferences and then it starts to put up some, uh, some serious conditionality. When we start to evaluate that kind of behavior from a democratic viewpoint, I think it's useful. But we should recognize that when we start doing this, as I think we will do here in the panel, panel we are also doing something that is very controversial. We are doing something that is quite provocative. Because we are saying then that who will decide what happens with the Swedish foreign policy. It's not something that will be decided only by the Swedes alone. It is rather something that will have to come or flow from a moral community that is international or that is global. And just like we would like to perhaps criticize what, what Turkey is doing, we will then have to accept that, that uh, the Swedish authority is subsumed or it is, it is under an, an international moral community. And that, of course, uh, means that also the enemies of Sweden, it means that, that, that uh, Russia, or, or I wouldn't say it's an enemy at this point, we should be careful with words, but, 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 uh, but states with very different interests can have their demands on Sweden, and we begin to, to negotiate on, on, on who will have the ultimate power over Swedish decisions. That was my, my second point. Democracy does not stop at the national border. The, the third point is in relation to the security issue, and it is somewhat familiar here, and, and the obligations of states to, to create uh, security for their own citizens. And I agree with, 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 uh, the, with the premise for this seminar that states do have a responsibility to create security for their citizens, but not only for the citizens. States also have a duty to create security for people in other territories, in, in, in other parts of the world. Remember, if you think that this is, this is, this is a strikingly naive story, if this sounds a little bit too liberal or too insufficiently realist uh, perspective. Think about how states are created. No state creates itself by its own forces alone. It's always recognized by, by, by an external state. You create states by international recognition. If 
you as a state threaten or undermine the security of your neighbors, they will hold you accountable. Uh, they will sometimes attack you and punish you if you don't uh, fulfill your, your, your obligations to create security uh, in, in that, that uh, area alone. And that is partly why we have reasons to, to be so upset uh, with, with Russia today, because it is not securing the, the lives of, of people in Ukraine and other parts of the world. But so again, we have states in order to create citizen security, but also to create global security or, or human security. And I think those are, those, are, those are, in a sense, reasonable starting points, but they are very rarely heard, even in Sweden, in, in these increasingly nationalist times. So, as, as an end, this was my starting points to, to your, 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 uh, your ideas here. And now I just would like to be a little bit more political and, and, um, and say what I think is most important uh, beyond, beyond the discussion to, 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 to secure Swedish citizens and, and also citizens in, in, in other countries. First, I think, for Sweden, is to deepen the analysis of the security situation, of its own security situation. Uh, and in order to know what is really the threats that come in the short term, in the long term. Is it only about territory? How much do we, do we think about the threats to identity, to, to other values, in, like in the economic security? Those were questions that were broadly rushed over in, in the too hasty uh, preparations of the Swedish decision. And we need to be clear on this in order to be, have a rational balancing between security on the one hand and, and democracy on, on, on the other hand. So, so that is one thing, deepen the, the security analysis it was too fast, we, we should now go out and, and do it better. Uh, the other thing that I believe is, is important at, at this moment we are in, it is to make NATO aware of its once proud uh, commitments to democracy that it has showed when it has been in the enlargement stages, where it has almost had the same criteria for membership as the European Union. Now we don't see that NATO. Now we see a NATO that, that is permitting members to, to, to require uh, downsizing the democracy in an applicant state. And I think that what we see here is in a part the reflection of the undemocratic character of many international negotiations. Or, and what we can do, or this would be the trick, uh, would be to try to launch or lobby for uh, a special session in NATO's uh, parliamentary assembly. Many people don't know that NATO has a parliamentary assembly. It's a representative uh, assembly that, that meets two times a year and it will meet in, in, in May next time. That's an excellent institution for having a debate about NATO's commitment to democracy and then to, to solve the, the issues between Hungary, Turkey, uh, uh, Hungary, Turkey and, and Sweden. Thanks. Mm. Thanks a lot. That's such a rich start. And with that, I will pass it on to Lisa. Yes, that was an excellent summary. And I think we have so many uh, points to go further on there. I've just taken down notes. So my three key perspectives coming from a journalistic um, freedom of speech, press freedom point of view, uh, are hopefully unique to this panel. Uh, because I want to bring up the parts that we don't really speak about. Obviously, I agree that this has been rushed through uh, and I do think that we really need to take citizens' concerns seriously about how they uh, feel that it has been a um, directly undemocratic process, uh, not just rushed, but undemocratic, which is obviously one level uh, more serious, uh, so to speak. Now, the responsibility of the press, uh, I would say, has... Um, not been brought up at all, but we have a huge problem in Sweden, which is that, as many of you here may or may not know, uh, the media industry is in crisis and has been for quite a few years now, which means that you've been cutting down on things like investigative teams and so on, and particularly on the coverage of uh, security and defense politics, not just in Sweden, but internationally everywhere. Uh, if you are very lucky, if you're one of the major newspapers, you may have one special writer. This is if you are Dagens Nyheter, you are Expressen. Uh, but even some of the biggest ones do not have a single specialized writer. Uh, and I believe from a citizen's perspective uh, that this is undemocratic in itself. And this is 
a contributing reason to why many so-called ordinary people feel that the decision has been so rushed. They have simply not been a part of the discussion. Uh, there's a, a relatively funny Swedish term called MERP, military over-interested person. Uh, it is a fact that many of us, perhaps us sitting here today, uh, it has been seen as a very specialized interest. You will find the greatest coverage in specialized blogs or pods, uh, some very specific Twitter accounts and so on, but the vast majority of the Swedish public uh, are simply not up to scratch. One thing where that is seen, uh, which I thought we could be discussing later, is the fact that many Swedes have the perception that we have gone from zero to 100 during last spring. They simply do not know that we have been a NATO partner uh, country. Uh, so where if, if you're using a bit of a crude language, you might say we're going from dating to marriage, uh, but uh, many of us wouldn't even know that we have been courting NATO. Now, you might know that we have participated in large-scale international exercises, but uh, are my um, belief from interviewing these so-called ordinary people is that you have no idea that it's connected to NATO. Uh, you simply think that we have been standing on the outside watching this and we are suddenly entering uh, this new territory. So it's no wonder uh, that it seems as rushed. The other point, the other perspective I would like to bring to the table here is the issue of the Swedish national identity. Um, I have uh, studied and written about for many years about nationalism, right-wing extremism, and national identity of course ties in very strongly with this. So we have uh, the idea at the heart of the Swedish identity that we are a neutral and alliance-free country. It should also be noted that these two terms are often completely mixed up. Uh, it's not the same being neutral as being uh, free from any alliances, but they're always said in the same sentence. And even here, all of you experts, uh, you know, working with defense, know that we weren't even neutral in the Second World War. We were having uh, regular contact with the, the Western powers and so on. Uh, and it's certainly, as I said, being in NATO partners before we applied for membership, not even the case uh, today. So this is something that even more explains, and I don't think has been discussed enough, uh, why it's been seen as such a dramatic development for the average Swede. Not only is it seen as undemocratic, entering a completely foreign and strange organization that we are seen as being having no part in whatsoever, but it's also getting to the heart of uh, the Swedish identity and saying, uh, you, without a referendum, without a national referendum on this, as we were allowed to have on EU uh, and even a vote on if we were going to have the euro currency or not, but here you're going to change our national identity and we're not going to be able to vote on it. Um, so that's my five minutes. And we will hopefully keep talking about it. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. yes. <laughs> no the answers here at all. Just questions, as a good journalist should. Yeah. Uh, it's so difficult to just pass it on after each and uh, every one of these inspiring uh, brief talks. But I have to pass it on to Magnus and uh, listen to his inspiring five minutes. Thank you so much, Attila. And thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I, is this, this is a seminar with a sort of moral and normative touch. I, I will start with confessing that I think uh, that I am, or not, I don't think I am for NATO. I think it was a good idea to create NATO in 1949. Um, and um, I think that NATO has made a good job uh, in. Uh, the, uh, uh, um, defending uh, both both democratical principles like individual liberty and the rule of law and so on, but also to hinder uh, a, a new uh, world war. Or, or, or the, the, in the beginning, it, it was a genuine fear that that the Soviet Union would would conquer uh, Western Europe as well, uh, and I think NATO hindered that. Um, uh, so I think, I think Sweden has a, a natural place in NATO within this within this context. And there's <coughs> the second point I would like to to make is that 
<coughs> a little bit like Lisa said, I think that this application that we saw in May last year is is not uh, it, it's not a, a, an example of a sudden change. It's it has been a process that has been going on for 30 years uh, that be, sort of began with uh, the Partnership for Peace in 1994. Sweden participated in all, all uh, major uh, NATO-led UN-mandated uh, peace operations in, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Afghanistan, in Libya. Um, Sweden um, and Finland as well um, uh, have uh, contributed to these operations more than actually uh, some NATO countries. Uh, and they have learned the routines, the doctrines, how to fight, how to plan military operations, how to conduct military operations together with, with, with NATO countries. So I see this as, as, a, as a natural last step in a 30-year process. And since I'm an historian, I can go even, even further back. I mean, already during the Second World War, the government sort of decided and, and, and realized that if we are going, if we, if we will be dragged into this war, we have to be on the, on the right side. And that was the side of the dem democracies. So, so already in 1939, 1940, uh, this uh, connection uh, security-wise to the, to the democracies was created. And during the, the, the Cold War, uh, this was uh, manifested in a, a sort of um, a systematic uh, military cooperation uh, secretly uh, with, with uh, the West uh, and the Nordic NATO uh, neighbors in, in particular. Um, third, uh, I want to say that I think that there is a lack of knowledge in Sweden, also as Lisa said, of what NATO actually is. Uh, also among politicians uh, that are experts on NATO, sort of experts on NATO. I mean, NATO is. I, I, I used to describe NATO as a as a, as a large scale permanent negotiation, uh, a little bit like you said, Hans, also. A negotiation between the United States and Europe, a no negotiation between uh, Northern Europe and Southern Europe. Uh, so, so, uh, and this negotiation becomes more and more complicated uh, when you go from 12 countries in 1949 to to uh, 16 during the Cold War and to 30 countries now. Um, so, um, and, and when, uh, since it's a, it's a consensus-based organization, which means that all 30 countries have a veto, they can, uh, they, they can demand something to give something in sit such a situation that we are in now, which we see openly with Turkey and Hungary. And it has probably, I don't know that because I don't have access to, to, to uh, internal mat material, but, but we have probably also had examples that we haven't seen yet of, of countries in NATO countries that have, has got something to accept uh, a Swedish uh, membership. Um, so um, what I think is most important, if I, <coughs> if I may say, it's always to, uh, to, to build up your own defense capability because we have, we have ruined that since the end of the Cold War. Uh, the, the first thing that you have to think about is to be strong by yourself. Uh, and that process has started. It started with the tw 2020 defense bill, but, but it, it it, it must also be implemented. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It's great to have this historical perspective added to. And I believe just where Magnus finished, we, uh, this is where 
perhaps Mike will pick up. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Atala. Great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Sorry, I'm sorry that I was late, by the way. Um, I will start with my own views. I do have a lot of issues uh, raised uh, by my co-panelists here, but I guess we'll take that before we let the public in right uh, afterwards. So I'll start with my own thinking about this, and I was very pleased to realize that I was invited by the Center for Ethics and something else at Stockholm. War and Peace. And War and Peace. Because I think these um, aspects are very, very frequently forgotten in terms of how our policy, Swedish policy in the fields of security and defense um, has evolved the last 20 years. And I would argue, perhaps in contrast to some of my panelists here, that the deeply troubling, utterly unethical um, presentation of this has been the policy run by various uh, Swedish governments until 2022. Namely to say that we do have a non-aligned security policy and there is no problems with that. This is the major issue in my mind because uh, for, from the beginning uh, of the Cold War, even during the Second World War, it was obvious, uh, very obvious, that to run a policy of neutrality or non-alignment, you need to have a very strong defense because otherwise, uh, one party can use your territory and deny the other party we, with which it is warring uh, the use of that territory or its resources or its people for that matter. And this means that uh, it was obvious for all the Swedish governments during the 50s, 60s and 70s that Sweden's defenses should be extremely strong, uh, not least depending uh, or in relation to the size of Sweden. In the 1950s, we had the world's fifth largest air force. In the 1980s, when I did my military service myself, we had about 800,000 troops in the military system in Sweden after mobilization. We had 55 surface combatants, i.e. warships. We had 12 submarines. We had 30 army brigades. And we had about 300 plus fairly uh, competent and modern uh, fighters, air force fighters, that is. Then in 2000 and 2004, we decided to get rid of that almost completely. We uh, decreased our defense force with about 90%, which means that we today have about one army brigade. Maybe even that is not working properly, it depends how you see it, but still one brigade aiming for three brigades in like five, 10 years. We have maybe seven at most surface combat combatants, uh, um, naval uh, um, fighting ships, uh, two submarines or three perhaps, one is always uh, under maintenance and about 60 air fighters and a complete or, or a total um, manpower in the armed forces of about 25,000 troops with another 20,000 home guard style lightly armed troops which makes a big difference if you compare it with the 800 troops we had 30 years ago. So uh, the unethical thing with this in my mind is that this has the relationship between our policy, our uh, spoken policy or our verbal policy in terms of non-alignment has not been linked to the utter uh, decreases and um, just disappearing uh, of the entire Swedish uh, armed forces to a very large degree. More than a 90% cut is a very substantial degree or, or uh, cut, however you measure it. So this is the, the problematic thing with the traditionalist view on Swedish non-alignment. We weren't able to uphold a non-alignment policy uh, for many years. And, and the fact that we now are changing is, according to what Magnus said, uh, much more uh, fairly logical and coherent policy rather than a dramatic shift as we at the same time has been, at least since 1994, but also especially the last 20 years, have been working very, very closely with NATO also in ways that the former non-aligned policy way before 2022 uh, was um, forbidding, so to speak. On the haste then of the decision to uh, apply for NATO membership, I think this is basically a non-issue actually, uh, in many ways. In the first place, what happened last uh, spring was that the Social Democrats changed their mind. 
uh, all the other parties of the centre-right opposition had changed their mind uh, years or decades before the Liberal Party changed in 1999, the Moderate Party in 2003, center, the Centre Party and the Christian Democrats in 2015, which is eight years ago, and then the Sweden Democrats, if you count that as a right-wing part, right -wing party, uh, which is debatable still, it's the Populist Party, they changed in 2021, in practice at least. So what happened last year was that the Social Democratic Party, as the major party in Swedish politics, changed their mind. This was the, the haste, if you wish. And that came as a surprise, certainly, for a number of their voters and their members. But on the other hand, we had a general election in uh, September last year, which means that if the general public would have shown its discontent with the Social Democratic Party, I bet that the Social Democratic Party would not have gained two percentage points as it actually did. They made a pretty strong election last year in September. And this means, of course, together with the fact that the polls now show that about 65 to 70 percent of the Swedish general public believes that NATO membership is a good idea. This proves that both national identity can change very quickly and also, of course, that the uh, change was not that radical. It was seen as a logical step also for a lot of the social democratic voters when they really saw the facts. We have a very aggressive neighbor in the East, which definitely uses military force to, to attain political goals. And you need to be strong together with others to do that, as is the social democratic line in many other ways in the domestic political, political system, for example. So if I want to, if I should paraphrase uh, Lisa's view here on the, the quick um, process from, I think you said, dating to full marriage in a few months or something mm -hmm. like that. That is true for the Social Democratic Party, but Sweden as a country, to continue with your metaphor, had had passionate sex with NATO for 10 years. I knew I was going to regret bringing up this dating <laughs> yes. metaphor. Now the that whole discussion... That is always very dangerous. And now I have to come up with system. something more witty. Yes, yeah. but that's my point on this, mm. and I will be happy to comment on my co-panelists' other views as well, but this, that was something I could resist. So. Oh. <laughs> right, thanks. Excellent, thank you. So now, now we have sort of a full board of, of views on the table and uh, some really interesting, uh, somewhat diverging perspectives too on, on some of the issues. And of course the, the, the first big issue is uh, in itself the non-moral or non-normative one, just how we characterize the situation. Is it really a radical break or is it more like a, as Magnus said, sort of the last almost natural step on a, a, a long road that Sweden has already been on. And uh, I suppose it really matters which perspective we take also for, uh, also for making a judgment about how much of a democratic deficit there is in the process. Um, if, if you think that this has been a radical break, then of course the hastiness point uh, comes with a, a, a much uh, bigger force, uh, whereas if you think this, we have been on this road together in, in normal democratic processes throughout, uh, you might think that the process was more satisfying. So uh, why don't we expand a, a, a little bit on that? Um, and uh, I would just give it back to Hans first. I'm happy to, to do because I, I'm really glad now to see how the panel have been composed so that we can have some different viewpoints and, and uh, hopefully clarify what is at stake here. And, uh, and I want to direct myself first to Magnus and, and then to, to, to Mike here. And, and if I understand the, uh, Magnus's perspective, it's a natural process that Sweden is now that's what you believe will end up as a NATO member no, so that there will be nothing possible to stabil stabilize it. I think that uh, when I characterize uh, what has happened here, primarily with the Social Democrats, as a breaking point, as something to discuss from a democratic sp perspective, it reflects the viewpoint that in politics we don't speak about natural processes. To speak about natural processes in politics is to defy responsibility. Uh, we should take stance, we, we, should take, uh, we should show our values, we should show our interest, but we should not pretend that there is a natural process that just leads us there. That's a way to, 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 to keep away from, from the responsibility. And, and once, you, once you start seeing that, then I believe that there is more of a change uh, a few months ago. But the second thing that may explain more of, of my 
the tension between between Mike and, and me here is is about the the relevance of publicity. I think there are things that may be equally powerful or as powerful or more powerful than the number of soldiers or air fighters or air carriers, and that is words in public. Words in public, as we see in Ukraine, uh, the, the, the creation of, of a willingness to sacrifice your lives for others, that is something that only comes in public. And we need to see that something very dramatical that happens when, when, when you are ready to do that. Yes, I agree that um, three or four parties had for a long time been, been willingness to uh, show uh, deep commitment to, to NATO membership, but they had not been... Uh, having to, to defend that position because everyone knew that as long as social democrats were not doing that, it was not a serious issue. So, so one, once the social democrats, which is itself an, an important part, uh, changed the, the playing board, we, there was a need for, for a deeper reflection than had been needed in, in any of those parties before. Mm, and I would just quickly like to comment, having written on uh, an issue that may seem completely irrelevant, but it's very similar here, and that is the issue of a republic or not in Sweden. And that is the same thing, that there are things that are written down in the formal programs of parties, that you want to abolish the monarchy, for example, and you want to bring in a republic. That doesn't mean uh, that people are prepared for it once it comes, right? And here's the same thing. Uh, I mean, if Mike is saying that, oh, well, you know, the only thing that happened was that the Social Democrats uh, changed their view. Well, that was um, something that no I mean, even, you know, journalist colleagues who've been sitting watching parliament debates year in and year out were completely taken by surprise. Um, so I just don't think we should underestimate, uh, even if it's just one sudden change, that change can be very dramatic. And I also don't think that we should ignore what voter dissatisfaction can actually mean. Um, if I understand you, Mike, correctly, you are saying, oh, it's, it's, no, it's not a big deal, and now people accept it, and the process is, is rolling. Yeah, from a defense perspective, but we also have a very strong nationalist uh, right-wing party, uh, and we have undemocratic tendencies in our society that are directly fed by processes that seem undemocratic and illegitimate in the voters' eyes. And if they don't cause problems now, they do uh, create problems further on because they erode the confidence that we have in our politicians. And this is not always possible to measure specifically or see now, um, but we already know in Sweden that... Um, uh, hatred against politicians uh, and a feeling that no one is listening anyway, we might as well turn to the populace and so on, is already a problem. Um, so uh, having such a huge process uh, initiated without people feeling that it's democratically legitimate, I'm saying it can uh, jump up and bite you in the behind, as the Americans say, in, for many years to come uh, and in scenarios that we are not even aware of today. Angus? Yeah, I can, I can take. Sorry. You have working? muted yourself. Have I? No, 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 I'm, <laughs> no I'm on. Yeah, sorry. A uh, couple of points. Um, I think that um, that Sweden, since the, this is, I'm an historian, so excuse me when I talk about history all the time, but. Um, since the First World War, since the end of the First World War, Sweden's first option in its security policy has actually not been neutrality. It has been solidarity. Sweden joined the League of Nations and, and hoped that it would work, uh, collective security, uh, but realized in the beginning of the 1930s that this won't work this time either. So went back to neutrality policy and was, a, was a formally neutral during, during the Second World War. Same thing the UN created. Uh, Sweden uh, joins the UN and hopes again for, for collective security. Uh, and um, 
uh, it, go, it, it takes just a few years, for 1948, the Cold War is established. Uh, the Scandinavian Defense Union, the, the negotiations uh, don't work. NATO, uh, sorry, uh, Norway and Denmark signs the North Atlantic Treaty, and, and Sweden goes back to neutrality policy. Same thing uh, after the end of the Cold War, Sweden starts to starts to um, uh, again uh, argue for co collective security. Uh, the UN even develops its own solidarity policy, which is sort of uh, uh, decided in in 2009. And as I see it, as I said, uh, the membership is also an act of solidarity. It's, a, it's an end point of the solidarity policy that has been the first option of Swedish security policy since 100 years ago, and neutrality policy is a fallback position. And on to Mike. Thank you. you. Well, um, let me again uh, start off where, where Keno Minus ended. Um, this idea that social democracy and NATO are things that don't go together is a very peculiar Swedish thing. If you look at the European social democratic parties, I, I wrote a major piece in Tiden, which is a semi-intellectual journal of the social democratic party, or at least close to it here in Sweden a few years ago. I went through the major social democratic parties of Europe and what they said about Europe, uh, what they said about security policy, and all of them, with the exception, of course, of the smaller ones like the Finnish and the Austrian, for obvious reasons, all were very much in favor of NATO membership. They saw it as perfectly social democratic to be part of an international alliance, which is based on international solidarity, which means that you help each other, that you also kind of help weaker parties against the aggressions of a stronger uh, third party, so to speak. This is exactly how a social democrat would agree or, or would see the domestic politics in various ways. The whole idea of unions, for example, come from, comes from this very uh, thought, so to speak. Uh, there is a peculiarity here in Sweden, though, where Sweden's um, social democratic leadership for many years uh, associated the policy of non-alignment with uh, other uh, former icons of the party like Olof Palme and the like in the 1970s. And this has, has really nothing to do with social democratic I ideology, I would say. And what we are seeing now, in contrast to what Lisa says, is that there is not much discontent by social democratic voters. They still vote for the social democratic party. There are no demonstrations of any size here in Sweden, for example. I've been watching a few of them on Södermalm. Lately, they managed to muster at most 500 people, at most, really. And, and that is a very small amount of people compared to the so-called uh, obvious uh, protests within the ranks of the party, uh, at least that is how many people see it, that there is a large number of discontented members of the party or among their voters. I don't, think, I don't think that is the case. The whole nature thing has been an effect of the same kind of seeing the emperor's new clothes. It's been obvious that Sweden cannot take on uh, an enemy of Russia's kind on its own. We don't have any anywhere near the, the manpower, the armed forces and the like to do that on our own. We don't know if this will ever be a real situation. It's hard to say. I, I think it's utterly uh, unlikely that Russia would attack mainland Sweden anytime soon, for example. But if that situation should occur, it's obvious to me that we won't be able to do it on our own. And that goes for, for the, the common social democratic voter as well, in my mind. At least I was mentioning right-wing parties here. I can agree in the sense that all right-wing populist parties are always feeding on anything in the mainstream establishment that can be regarded as undemocratic. That's true. But on the other hand, if you look at the Sweden Democrats now, I guess you, meant, you, you were kind of um, having them in mind here. They're fully in favor of NATO membership. They're attacking Russia as much as anyone else. The only party of any size, and that is very small, who argues against uh, this and uh, in favor of NATO, uh, sorry, of the Swedish non-alignment, is the 
Alternative für Sweden party, the, the alternative for Sweden, that is. Uh, and they are getting, in the last election, they get half the vote of the party nuance. I mean, the Islamist party, who, get, who gained about 29,000 votes, and, and I believe AFS got about 16,000 votes in the entire country. So this is not a big thing for them either, in my mind. Um, talking about the democratic process, I have to say this to Hans as well. Um, you were alluding to, I think anyway, that uh, you would have preferred a process like the EU membership process, which took three years or something before we, went, we became members. We applied in 91 and then we became members in 95. And during that time, we had a very lengthy, open public debate with all forms of um, state commissioned uh, reports and the like on the consequences of uh, Swedish EU membership. That is true, and that was nice from a democratic perspective, but as you know, uh, the difference here was that all of a sudden eight par seven, uh, sorry, six out of the eight parties in Parliament changed their mind uh, dramatically, and uh, sorry, the Social Democratic Party did, but that changed dramatically the majority in the Parliament very quickly. And then we had a general election, and then, of course, for most of the parties in power, uh, maybe not the Social Democrats, because they had, as you said, not taking this issue seriously for a very long time. But uh, there was a certain knowledge about this in uh, many political factors. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Defense, all knew what NATO was about. Uh, at the universities, even at the Defense College, uh, people knew nothing about this. I mean, you can just look at your own university, or the gentleman here belong to the same university. How many courses on NATO have your departments had the last 10 years? Probably none. And that means that in the academic world, in the media world, this is a big shock. But for us, I am, I've been working at the Defense Agency now for many years. And for us, this was no news at all. And we had all the knowledge we needed to approve a decision as well. I was so first, to quickly. Lisa. Yes, yeah. Lisa and Hans. And uh, we. <laughs> no, just quickly, uh, the number of protesters at physical demonstration is an awful uh, measurement tool for dissent. Uh, it says pretty much nothing, especially in the digital world of social media uh, where we see today. If you look at the activity and the number of anti-NATO group on Facebook and so on, you will see uh, a very different pictures. Um, when we're speaking about uh, voter dissent, I'm not speaking merely of uh, the social democrats. We're talking about the big uh, left, for example, and uh, a huge majority of uh, the left party voter uh, base, for example, is very, very strongly uh, against NATO membership. But that's, so that's just a quick clarification. But also I think it's interesting with the social democrat in Sweden as standing out in an international uh, perspective as um, having previously been against membership um, because I've written extensively on the influence of the peace movement on uh, the Swedish social democratic movement and on the general debate uh, as well as what's being written in the media and so on. And I think here it's really worth taking up in this discussion how powerful and influential it's been actually since the 60s and 70s. Mm, and it's to such an extent that non-alignment has almost become similar to the peace movement's arguments. Um, you can see it as well in opinion articles published daily still uh, that the arguments are uh, that you should not use weapons at all, that war is by definition bad, military aid is per definition bad, I mean, disregarding what kind of conflict it is, disregarding the fact that Russia is the aggressor invading uh, a non-hostile Ukraine, uh, it's still bad because we're talking about guns and other kind of military weapons that are killing people. So this pacifist um, ideology uh, is unusually strong in Sweden. And I think it's a mistake that to write it off, uh, as we usually say, Övervintra the hippies, some old uh, guys who were, you know, active back in the hippie days and they haven't woken up to the new realities. Because the fact is that the people who are active and who are spreading these 
pacifist arguments are very much of all ages and backgrounds, often lots of academics, we have uh, theater boss and so on, uh, who are very influential. And they are actually not uh, from only the left as well. You also have people voting uh, to the right who have this very strong black and white uh, pacifist agenda. And that is quite unique uh, to Sweden, or at least to the Nordic countries. And this has certainly influenced, and I do think we should acknowledge uh, this group and this movement much more. Just a very brief thing, and thanks Magnus and, and Mike, on both what you say and, and the diplomatic tone with which you accommodate the, the offensive uh, start here. Uh, one thing, it is not that we would have needed more democracy in the process of preparing Sweden's decision to apply for membership for democracy's sake. It is because it is likely to have made the process more effective. Now it has got stuck. Uh, now we don't know uh, when a membership will come up here. And, and the speed and the lack of preparation uh, which has led us there is also the, the defect of democracy here. So I'm not on, or I don't have any data to tell that, that there would be anything near a, a substantive minority against Swedish membership. I, I, I completely buy the fact that the will of the people in Sweden is to join NATO. So that's not the problem. The problem is that when you do things, when you get uh, overwhelmed by the importance of, of, of security issues and, and you forget that there is a lot of other things that can, that can kill people, uh, you can be killed by an environmental crisis, you can be killed by, by a bad prioritization in the economy, and, and you think only in one direction, uh, th then it easily happens that, that, that you miss important aspects. And here we missed Hungary and Turkey, and probably a few other things as well. So it's just an effectiveness, strategic argument for democracy. Yes, please. Well, I go on until you stop me, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> I will. But yeah, sure. Uh, on Lisa's views on the big left, well, the big left in terms of the left party is, of course, against NATO membership. I mean, they, they were, after all, uh, on the losing side of the Cold War. So that's not very strange uh, in itself. But the big left is not that big. They, they usually carry about 10% of the vote. And if you add on the 5%, uh, 5 7% uh, Greens and the... Um, discontented left-wing social democrats and the AFS people, um, Alternative für Sweden again, uh, I mean the right-wing nationalists who agree with the, the left in this regard, then you, you don't reach more than 30% at most, I would say. And that is not even now forming as a substantial minority as we do have another 10, 15% undecided on the issue of NATO. So uh, even if you're absolutely right in terms of the influence of uh, leftist leaning peace movements in the 1980s, uh, maybe in the 1990s as well, but especially in the 1980s, this was a long time ago, and that's simply not the case anymore, uh, as I read at least how Swedish domestic politics is now playing. Uh, on Hans, then, uh, words are more important than tanks and so on. Uh, I mean, that is true to a certain degree, but you need tanks as well to be able to show to the world that you have a credible foreign policy and security policy. And it was obvious for most people outside Sweden that we hadn't. Uh, that's also, that was very much reinforced the last 20 years of all the very, very close uh, gold card relationships and all that that we had with NATO for many years now. And that was something that um, other people in other countries accepted because we kn they knew that we had a difficult domestic situation and they just waited out the, the Social Democratic Party to change. This is my, my, this is my take on it. I don't think the, even for the closest a bit kind of, um, let's say, native, gone native researchers in other countries, I mean, in Poland and no Norway and so on, who really follow Sweden. They were surprised. Most other countries weren't. Uh, this is a paradox in its own right. Um, yeah, I can Excellent. Start. So uh, we, I think we have at least two very important points that I, I just want to underline here uh, that emerge from the discussion so far. Uh, one is that non-alignment itself um, can, can range from basically a concept of national self-interest to an ex uh, a means of and expression of international solidarity to actual pacifism. So we, depending on what we understand uh, it to stand for, we will have, of course, extremely different views on 
what the democratic process has to do in this at all, or what it should aim at, or 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 how uh, NATO membership is good for uh, Sweden a as well as uh, for others. And the other interesting point, I think, that that uh, emerged as uh, maybe a subject of agreement between disagreeing views is that uh, uh, solidarity uh, is very important and has been very important historically. So um, uh, whatever you think about uh, the hastiness or non-hastiness of the process or the actual goal of uh, joining NATO, there seems to have been disagreement on, uh, on the assumption that uh, Sweden is not only responsible for its own residence security, but it has actually a lot to do with other security as well. And uh, the discussion around NATO uh, accession also has a, a place uh, for that insight. And uh, so a, a lot has also been said already about the democratic process. Uh, it, um, what you see as uh, um, its uh, shortcomings or why you see it as uh, adequate. Um, what would you do in a different way um, in the future or what could have been done in a different way in the past uh, in the Swedish democratic process? And uh, um, let me just put one um, potential um, um, point on the table that uh, some of you have addressed but, uh, but it hasn't received a lot of attention. Namely, uh, the question of a referendum. So Hans earlier uh, uh, talked about a more bottom-up process, uh, whereas uh, Mike emphasized that th uh, this was a process that, that uh, uh, had to be um, well initiated and concluded in a, a more constrained time frame than uh, some other major decisions in the hi uh, recent history of Sweden. Um, so how, how does that fare, uh, how does that square with the question of uh, referendums or, or other means? Just to, uh, just to uh, have some comparative perspective. So for example, Spain did have a referendum uh, on NATO. Interestingly enough, in 86 and it joined in 82. So I'm just saying not too late necessarily. Um, Hungary had a referendum in 97 before joining. Uh, so did Slovakia, which ended up as a legally invalid referendum due to a lack of interest of uh, voters. Um, Slovenia also had a, a referendum on joining in 2003. And, uh, um, of course, uh, what that might be um, of less uh, urgent significance, Georgia and uh, Macedonia did, North Macedonia did too. So uh, th this, is, this is the perspective to uh, compare uh, Sweden with. Is this relevant at all or it, I or it is not relevant at all? Lisa, you wanted to say something. To yes, but then Sorry. you moved on, <laughs> so I'm <laughs> jumping back. Uh, you said, what could have done better? I immediately have to bring up something we haven't even talked about yet, uh, and that is uh, which many of us who have covered Hungary over the years have been wondering, and this, how could the politicians not see this coming? And I saw today that Annie Reuterskjöld, which is a brilliant Swedish political reporter, uh, openly uh, expressed the same. She said, this is a piece I wrote this uh, autumn. I interviewed Hungarian politicians and they were saying, you know, we're very uncertain what we're going to do about Sweden. And, and like for, for all of us who've covered this country under Orban's regime, we know that Sweden has been so critical. We've been among the most critical EU nations of everything from the harassment of the Roma minority in Hungary uh, to the, the slow uh, uh, downgrading of democracy and the firing of uh, people you just don't like and um, just a general uh, complete devaluing of democracy in Hungary. So my question is, uh, I mean, I guess to the audience, when we're going to do audience questions for all of you here, how was it possible uh, for Swedish politicians not to take into account that they would actually not welcome us with open arms? What would you say? The historian's perspective <laughs> yeah. would be very valuable. No, I can, I can add on that, I think. Uh, I think, I, I actually think, without knowing it, 
that the politicians kidnapped the process from the diplomats. Mm -hmm. Because Sweden has always had very good diplomats and they know these things. They know that Turkey would have a problem mm -hmm. with, with Sweden. They know that perhaps Hungary would have a problem with Sweden, other countries, NATO countries. Uh, and, and instead of going to these countries with diplomatic delegations under the radar mm -hmm. and talk to, the, to these, uh, the, the counterparts and make sure that they want to, to, to let Sweden in, mm -hmm. Uh, the ministers, they go to London and uh, Canberra and Washington and Paris and to countries that we already know, knew that would let in Sweden. So I, I think it's, I think it, uh, that would be very interesting to study in the future if, if the politicians kidnapped the process. Mm, it's a good theory, and as you say, the same thing that I said about Hungary can be said for Turkey as well. They've been very aware of our um, stance on the Kurdish question and have been equally critical of us. All of this is out in the open. All of this is, you can just follow as a normal citizen following news. You don't even have to be a journalist yourself to know this, so... Yes, yeah. Mike sure. and then Hans. Right, um, two things here. I think Elisa brings up a very valid point. Um, and that goes to some of the arguments Hans made before as well on democratic effectiveness. Uh, in the first place, if you know anything about NATO, you know as well that democracy as a criterion for NATO membership is a, is a fairly new thing. It came into the NATO textbook in 1995 when the first round of enlargement to the east was going to happen. When NATO was formed in 1949, Portugal, who is a founding, which is a founding member of NATO, was a full-blown dictatorship and stayed so until the early 1970s. Turkey and Greece have had uh, years of military dictatorships each as well in the 70s and 80s in particular. That led to some sanctions within the NATO system. They were suspended from doing certain things within the NATO framework, but they weren't thrown out because you cannot be thrown out if you're a NATO member. There is no way that uh, a country can not uh, lay its own veto, so, so to speak, against that. Because NATO is a fully um, veto-based, consensus-based organization. So in 1995, you added, or NATO added this criterion of democracy, but that also goes to the grain of Hans's argument and, and kind of kills it in my mind because the same reasons that are now played out in Ankara and in Budapest would have been played out as well, even if we had taken a very long democratic uh, explorative kind of route for our own membership. I mean, the same national interests that are now propelling um, Erdogan and Orban to say certain things about their relation to us would have been the case then as well. And joining NATO means that you have to take into account all the NATO members' various interests to a reasonable degree. And changing our freedom of expression laws is not part of that, so to say. Changing our terrorist laws might be if there is a certain need for it, but um, this is something that you have to stake out, and that has nothing really to do with the Swedish democratic process as such. So, um, going back to the question of the referendum, how can we do things better? Uh, given that we believe that democratic procedures have some, some benefits when it comes to, to outcomes. Uh, and I would not be too much a fan of, a, particularly in referendum, I mean there are different reasons as to why you can have a referendum. One is, is that the political parties are divided in s internally and, and then they call a referendum in, in order to, to avoid a split. I don't think that's a reason for anyone outside a political party to to, to, to avoid a referendum, but, but I, don't think we should, I don't think we should give them that. I think they, it's better to split the party, so to say, from, from, a, from a people's perspective. Uh, another reason why, why you can like to have a referendum is that people need to be informed. They, they need to wake up. I don't think we need that in, in, the, in, the, in the NATO debate either, that there is sufficient, uh, there is sufficient uh, engagement. So, so what would be needed in, instead is, is something like deliberative democracy, is, is greater 
openness. It's, it's uh, even if there was certainly a number of experts or self-appointed experts in, in the in the defense branch or in the defense college, uh, those uh, that knowledge did not come out uh, sufficiently in, in a sufficiently broad area to to predict what would happen with Turkey. If that would have been predicted, the procedure would have been different. It would have been slower. To, to begin with. Uh, one would have tried different things. One would have prepared to, to build alliances uh, prior to, to, to launching uh, the official uh, preference to, to join NATO, because now we are really in deep shit. And we, we, it would have been better if predicting uh, that uh, Turkey would stop it to wait until securing that they would not stop it. That would have been a secure situation for Sweden. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, so much to discuss, but we still have one big uh, um, roadblock ahead of us that I, I would like us to discuss before uh, opening up to the audience. Um, and, and that is um, something that you have already touched upon. So what is it that other mem uh, already current member states of a military alliance owe to a state who has, uh, I think Hans has started with this, opened up or showed out in the open by uh, taking non-alliance uh, its uh, co true colors, so to speak. Um, we, uh, we see that there is a, a delay or a block uh, uh, coming both from the Turkish and the uh, Hungarian political processes. In, in Turkey, um, it, it looks like uh, until the beginning of April, which is the, uh, the end of the current parliamentary session before the May elections, um, if there is no decision, then uh, who knows when a decision on ratifying uh, Sweden's membership may come. And in Hungary too, um, um, uh, a, a statistician uh, has made an, an interesting uh, study uh, comparing the uh, time frames of um, various acts of parliament in Hungary recently and um, he concluded that out of the approximately 2,300 acts of parliament uh, promulgated since uh, 2010, uh, 14 bills uh, took as long as uh, Sweden's uh, 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 accession ratification. So um, Hungary is also giving it a very um, reflected thought. So um, wh what is the perspective on uh, on this? How, how should we uh, think about these processes where um, Sweden is asked to um, um, uh, take repentance or uh, to make uh, uh, serious compromises, including uh, extradition of uh, uh, people uh, potentially um, uh, uh, seeking refuge on its territory. What do we make of the, uh, these future allies of Sweden in moral terms? And what do we make of the compromises that Sweden might uh, need to or uh, not want to take? Up for grabs. I can start. Or? No, I think you start. Yeah, sure. sure. I can get um, International politics is very often uh, fundamentally immoral. I mean, this is not an issue among states, unfortunately. We would like it to be, but this is simply not the case in many circumstances. And again, I, I don't think I disagree with Hans again here in terms of how. Uh, deep we are in something because I believe we will become members to the uh, NATO July summit in Vilnius this year, this summer. I see no reason not to uh, because if you look at what the Turks demanded of the Finns just half a year ago uh, or less, it was, you know, extradite 20 Kurds, uh, do this and that, uh, do, you know, uh, various things regarding Finnish domestic politics, and all of a sudden these demands were lifted. The Finns extradited, I believe, two people uh, of Kurdish descent, but uh, uh, who were, so to speak, um, uh, already uh, identified criminals or related to the PKK. I, I cannot remember which, but it was a fraction of the number of people that Turkey had wanted extradited anyway. We can do that as well, and uh, you've seen the, the Erdogan arguments. Well, it was first 34 and then 74, and now it's about 120 uh, various curves here. I mean, this is a bargaining tool, not 
true or not something that even Turkey takes seriously. Uh, this is my understanding anyway. And uh, for, for Hungary as well, I mean, uh, as Lisa pointed out, Swedish politicians have been extremely critical to Hungary for the last 10 years or more. Um, this has to do with their domestic politics and their relationships to the EU, not in terms of security policy or the relationship between Hungary and other NATO allies and so on. So I think this also is a sidebar. They want to use this in order to link their own process to Turkey's for various reasons. But I think this will be solved in July and um, thus I don't see this as a particular big problem. Uh, sorry, I have to uh, say that from an ethical perspective that we are having today, I don't think we should speak about the human lives as in, you, you know, a bargaining tool with uh, regimes that are authoritarian or even uh, bordering dictatorship, like, oh, it's just 120 Kurds, we can, we can uh, treat them like uh, chess pieces. If we're going to have uh, any legitimacy as uh, diplomats, as peacemakers, as, you know, having a moral and ethical conscience as a nation, we cannot take this, uh, these processes lightly of just saying, well, give uh, Orban what he wants. I mean, it's not, it's not tools or, or weapons we are speaking about here. And it, comparing it to Finland is a bit awkward because they have never had uh, nearly as big an issue with Finland when it comes to the Kurdish question as they have with Sweden. We have taken in many more uh, people that either have been fighters or that Turkey have accused uh, of being fighters. So, you know, I think we should, um, we don't want to lose our, uh, our moral ground in this lengthy process. I hope you're right, Mike, that um, Erdogan will simply give up and, and um, uh, let Sweden in uh, by uh, some date in, in July. And, and, and uh, then we will just be, be there and, and happy. And I think that would be the reasonable outcome. But uh, I agree completely with Lisa Hare that starting to bargain with, with human individuals, uh, I mean, human individuals, we are speaking about specific groups here, under the protection of international law, um, it's a huge risk, even from a security perspective, to start even thinking about extradition. We know we have been talking about the NATO membership primarily from, from the perspective that, that Sweden's the Swedish territorial security would be enhanced. We know that we, when you start terrorism, that the foreign policy is a main trigger for, for terrorist violence. And, and should Sweden start uh, doing these kinds of actions, tra trading with, with human rights and other things, we're, we're putting ourselves in a situation that at least deserves serious consequence analysis bef before we start uh, talking about it. These are I'm a little bit vague here, it? because you can easily talk these problems into being, mm -hmm. in, in a sense. And uh, then just one more thing, if, if, we, if we think about the whole situation only as an amoral, uh, playing among uh, self-interested actors, and we, we follow the, the logic here, we should just notice two, two, two things, and it is that, yeah, if, if Turkey is behaving that way, if following that, that logic, Sweden's membership into NATO does not seem to be very important for security in Turkey, in NATO. Uh, Hungary doesn't agree, it doesn't appear to be important to everyone. So that can lead us also to think, if we take that perspective and don't look at the moral, moral issues at all, that can lead us to, to think that perhaps the process here is driven by a sense of, yeah, it's natural for Sweden to be there, not thinking as, as rational as, as we possibly can. Closing words, Magnus. I, th I think it's also worth to um, think about long-term and short-term perspective, because uh, I think m probably from my point of view, it's more interesting to talk about what can we do long term when we become members because there has been a lot of worries uh, in the debate that Sweden will be restricted by NATO that we can't do this we can't do that and we can't do that we can't we can't um, be sol uh, solidaric with the third world we can't uh, we can't be a serious mediator we can't uh, we can't be against nuclear weapons and so on and so forth uh, 
But, but I think that uh, having studied uh, NATO, uh, that, that actually many NATO countries can uh, be uh, mediators, can be against nuclear weapons, can be for aid and for the third world issues and so on and so forth. Norway is an obvious example, but I mean, it's uh, it, uh, uh, when you are in, you, you can, <laughs> I don't think that it, it's, it's your own choice if you want to be restricted or not. Well, th thank you so much. I think that's an excellent uh, point to, if not close on, then move on to the uh, next phase of the discussion, thinking about Sweden's long shot as a, a potential NATO member. There has been so much that you brought up, and obviously we, we uh, couldn't follow every thread to its end. But please join me in thanking this excellent panel for this super rich discussion this has been just fantastic i think and uh, now we will continue actually uh, but uh, involving the audience uh, i just want to note that we also are lucky enough to have an online audience we are uh, we are so grateful that uh, people outside of this room are also following us for technical reasons unfortunately we can only take um, questions from the local audience, but I hope you will all stay with us. So with that, I would open it up to the floor. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of questions or comments. Uh, first, I think it was very good of you, Magnus, to point out the issue of solidarity, because actually, Sweden gave up neutrality when, under Jalmar Branting, we joined the League of Nations. And I think, you know, the concept of uh, non-alignment has not been within us since we joined the European Union. So, I mean, it is just that the political debate has not re reflected realities in this case as in many other cases. Uh, however, so I fully agree with you. Solidarity is there. But what is it also that we are... Sol Solidarity, which is the purpose of solidarity. And I would say that purpose of solidarity is also with Finland. I think actually Swedish decision making, in particular within the Social Democratic Party, uh, was very much influenced by the, Swed by the Finnish discussion. We have a long solidarity with Finland that goes back, well, thousand years, <laughs> but if we take the long historical perspective. And I think that really changed the, the mind of social democratic decision making. Uh, I think, and that was also, if you read the, 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 the programs of the parties that were for NATO membership, uh, like the non-socialist parties, they had as a requirement that Sweden and Finland would join together. And when Finland, decides to do that, I mean, it just follows more or less automatically uh, that Sweden should follow a, a path with, with, with Finland. That political various things has not be, been uh, progressing this way uh, is another matter, but I think solidarity with Finland should also be, it's a global solidarity, but also solidarity with Finland. I think a comparison with the European Union is a little bit, um, it's not the same thing, because the European Union is a supranational organization. They could make decisions that automatically becomes laws in Sweden. Uh, that is not the case with NATO. NATO is an alliance between countries that still have very much a of a consensus principle. So, I mean, I think it was fully justified to have a referendum with the European Union, but not with NATO. That is something that we could discuss with. I think also when Mike pointed out that we had a 90% cut of Swedish defense efforts, that was also something that very much in influenced Swedish, the knowledge of the Swedish people on defense and security issues, because we should remember that we not only had a military defense, but also an economic defense and a psychological defense. And when these, and a civil defense. And when these other kinds of uh, defense activities were reduced, we also reduced debate 
about uh, security issues. Uh, so uh, I think that was also something that contributed to a lack of interest and a lack of knowledge because previously when we had conscription, everybody knew something about defense and security, which we don't nowadays. Um, and uh, a final question when it comes to political processes. Uh, one thing that is very interesting is that the uh, when we're talking about Hungary, is that the Hungarian Air Force just consists of Swedish aircraft. Uh, they are, um, uh, Saab is exporting, I think they have about a 12 or 15 uh, uh, JAS aircraft, but that has never, as far as I know, been brought into the discussion. Uh, and actually, uh, Hungary is planning to, to, to develop its Hungarian Air Force with Swedish aircrafts in the near nearest years. So that is just an example of the excellent uh, defense industrial cooperation between Sweden and Hungary. And that has not been brought into the debate. And then finally, we can always have the question, what happens if Trump or somebody of his caliber wins the US election and NATO <laughs> is abolished? We might not go that far, but uh, <laughs> Magnus, I think you were addressed primarily. hear any questions, heard any questions, I, I, yeah, exactly, so I, yeah, I, I agree, and I mean, Sweden and Finland was uh, the same country for 600 years, and, and, uh, and, and we see, we saw, also we saw the same pattern happening during the interwar years, uh, when uh, the international situation became uh, more difficult, that Sweden and Finland started to cooperate militarily, uh, almost exactly in the same way that, that we did uh, that we have done the last 10 years, uh, defense of, of Åland, for example, bringing uh, Swedish army brigades into Finland, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that, that you're totally right there. And, and that, but it, I, I guess that it was also pressure, not only from fi external pressure, not only from, fi from Finland, but also from, from important uh, uh, great power NATO states such as the United States and, and the, the UK and, and Germany and so on. Uh, cut and uh, legitimacy or knowledge about defense, absolutely. I, 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 I think you're totally right. I didn't have time to say it uh, during the panel, but I mean, uh, the, 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 the gradual integration in NATO from, from of Sweden from 1994 onwards, uh, slowly but steadily gradu uh, integrating more and more and more in NATO was a totally open process. Uh, you can read it in propositions, in, uh, in the governmental material, everything was open, um, uh, which is not was <laughs> during the Cold War. That was a democratic problem. But I don't see it as a democratic problem, the integration in NATO, because it has been so open. But nobody has been interested in it. They haven't read these reports. They haven't read these bills. They haven't read these decisions. Uh, so I think, I think you're right, uh, absolutely there. And, and um, uh, Swedish uh, fighter jets in Hungary, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you there as well. I haven't seen any comments about that. Maybe it could be a bargaining ship, I don't know, talking about bargaining. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I, I, I think we have to go on to the next question. Yes. I yeah. will just ask questions and not make long comments. Um, about the foresight of uh, the reaction of Turkey and Hungary, uh, I was really surprised how the uh, Swedish government um, acted on, on nego negotiations. A uh, trilateral agreement at the beginning of the previous, uh, with the previous government was rather okay and very way, vague. But afterwards, when the new government sat on the table, Turkey started to make uh, concrete demands, like naming, giving the names of the people to be extradited. Um, 
But on the other hand, Sweden, Sweden had a lot of leverage, like arms embargo. It was lifted without getting anything. So, uh, and Turkish economy is in shambles. And in June, in July, uh, Erdogan ma may not be uh, the president. There, there is uh, elections on May, even if it's the second tour, it's 28th of May, 14th of May, and the second tour, if it happens, on the 28th. So by June, th there might be a new government in Turkey. But the state and the, the military has still to tutelage in Turkish uh, uh, gover governance. So they may still uh, continue with the demands. But uh, my question is, uh, how do you think uh, Swedish government hold these negotiations? How could it be otherwise? For example, United States has a big leverage on Turkey. It could be through them. After Mike, Mike Pence's visit to Turkey, Turkish position has changed, softened. So um, uh, it would be nice to hear a critical point of view of how Swedish government held these negotiations. Thank you. Anyone would like to pick that up on that? I'm not an expert on, 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 on these uh, diplomatic practices, but I just take their word because I want to get back to, to one of the things I said initially uh, about the parliamentary assembly in, in NATO. And I want to come to that, but before saying that, of course, the Swedish strategy to negotiate better must be to uh, make NATO countries responsible for, for this outcome. It can no longer go on to, to have negotiations directly between Stockholm and, and, and Ankara. Uh, what kind of organization does NATO want to be? Does it want to be an organization that, that requires lowering of democracy in, in its member states or not? And in order to just dissolve the, the, the obstacles that uh, have, or the possible prestige within NATO, that Stoltenberg didn't get this when he started to construct the process as one of, of negotiations between Stockholm and Ankara. In order to get by these, these obstacles, I, I think that, okay, go for the parliamentary assembly. Um, lobby for, for them to have a special session in order to, to, to wake up the, the democratic nerve since 1995 in, in NATO. On Turkey, well, obviously, uh, I'm only speaking, and that goes for this whole panel, I'm only speaking my own mind, but I do have at my department a number of Turkish specialists, and I also work for the Swedish Defense Ministry and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and uh, it's obvious to me that in the spring of 22, uh, both the Finnish and the Swedish government got reassurances from all the relevant Turkish actors, including apparently Mr. Erdogan himself in a direct te te telephone call between him and the Finnish president, saying that they would have raised no objections whatsoever to Swedish and Turkish membership in NATO, Swedish and Finnish, sorry, membership in NATO. And then the turnaround, which was fairly dramatic, came as a major surprise, especially for the Finns. They really hated this because this has been a major worry in the Finnish security policy debate for a decade or so, namely that some uh, Putin-oriented regime in NATO, I mean a member state, would stop their own um, membership process when they have officially said that they're onto it, so to speak. Because the NATO issue, being a member of NATO, is something else than becoming a member of the EU or the OSCC. Uh, for a third part, i.e. Russia in this case, if you say that you're not neutral anymore, but you want to belong to an alliance that is composed of enemies to the third part, then you're in a dangerous situation and you want to be in that window for as short time as possible. Then this is a standard kind of international relations thing, although it's a bit exaggerated, but still. But Sweden and Finland did what they had to do in the spring of 22, then the Turks changed, and the Turks are always changing like that. They, they made something three years ago, I think in 19, 
four years ago, which was to block the entire NATO defense planning for Poland and the Baltic states, who were already NATO members. And they wanted instead NATO to designate a Kurdish group in Syria as a terrorist group. NATO didn't want to do that as this group was an ally, a military ally of the United States against the Assad regime in Syria. <clears throat> so the Turks instead dropped that demand and uh, accepted um, more or less a bribe, namely a four-star uh, general appointment in the NATO military structures and something else that related to more help from the Americans in, in the arms deals issues and so on. So what I'm saying is that we should not extradite Kurds. Of course not. We are not doing that either. This is the point. We're not lowering our democratic standards. The few people we have extradited so far are extradited in accordance with Swedish law. And that's going to be how it continues. And as we started just five minutes later, I take the liberty to finish five minutes later, which leaves <laughs> us with one uh, more final question. So it was said early on in the discussion that states um, have an obligation to provide security not only for their own citizens, but also for the citizens of other countries. And what seems most important to me from that perspective is how um, Sweden's joining NATO affects the probability or likelihood of a NATO-Russia conflict in the future. So how can we reason about that? And given um, the situation as it is right now, how might we best um, try to lower that probability or avoid that outcome? Okay. Um, I, I can begin because I, you, you referred to some of the moral concepts that I, that I introduced, but it's also a very shaky ground, so I begin with a simpler case uh, rather than the bigger case. The bigger case would be the how Sweden's membership affects the conflict between, between NATO and Russia, uh, the, which is difficult. The, the simpler one would be, okay, how would Sweden's membership affect countries like Moldavia, Georgia, Georgia uh, I, a lot of countries in, in that region. And here my, my, this would be my guess, and I would really need critical reactions from others, because here I think we need to think together in order to not get exaggerated. But I think uh, Sweden's membership would worsen their situation. Uh, uh, in, in, in that international system, there is a need for, 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 for lowering the conflict level uh, rather than, than standing up sharp. Uh, and, and to have as many players as possible in, in the negotiation team, uh, not only Austria and, and Switzerland. Uh, when it comes to the bigger, bigger uh, case, which is between NATO and, and Russia, then one really needs to have, and how Sweden's membership would affect that, then, then we really need to take a stance between whether balancing is effective or whether integration and talking is the more effective. And uh, I would be happy for some, if someone else would dare taking uh, an idea on that first, and then I can perhaps come back. Sure. Well, um, the, interesting, the question is very interesting, and you can answer it in, in many ways. Uh, we're talking about ethics here, at least partly, and, and um, I want to underline that the former policy of Sweden, that, that is neutrality and non-alignment, is fundamentally a highly immoral policy. It was an isolationist policy. It was to say to our neighbors that we don't care if you're raped, invaded, burnt to the ground, and so on, as long as we save our own skin, if you put it a bit metaphorically. And this is not really moral in any sense. Öster Nundén, one of the um, real uh, formers of this policy, the, foundating, uh, the, the founder of, of modern Swedish neutrality policy, uh, said explicitly that this is in not an amoral part or not an immoral policy uh, in the sense that it's not moral. It's an amoral policy. That's the use, the, the word he used. It, uh, it is a question that has nothing to do with morality whatsoever. You can dis discuss that as I see isolationism as, as not that good um, from a moral perspective, but there is an ethical argument to, that you can make in favor of isolationism as well. But the former policy was based on this isolationism. Now we are he um, heading to something that could be called international solidarity, as several of my panelists were talking about here. And that is another thing. Um, 
the big change, though, from a military perspective with Sweden joining NATO is, especially compared to our um, explicit policy, uh, verbal policy, so to speak, in the 70s and 80s, is that, that we now are entering a process and a system of deterrence and balancing rather than uh, negotiations and, uh, you know, this idea of mediation uh, from a verbal perspective. The Swedish foreign policy and defense policy of the 60s and, and 70s were also, was also based on deterrence in the sense that we would deter any invader for, at, from attacking us. But the idea behind it was still the idea of isolationism, neutrality as a way of saving your own skin, so to speak. Uh, now deterrence is something else, and this is more fundamental and more fundamental change for the Swedish armed forces than uh, the formal membership in NATO, I would say, because that means that they will have to be integrated in a process that will lead to deterrence rather than negotiations, deterrence of Russia in this case. And if this heightens or decreases the, the uh, um, risk uh, coefficient or, or whatever you want to call it with a war against Russia, that's an open question. It's a matter of belief, I would say, rather than anything else. So many open questions uh, that, that we have to end with. Yeah. Um, but I would just like to thank again all our panelists for this extremely rich discussion. Uh, I think we have covered a, an extreme amount of ground in, in this amount of time that we had our, uh, at our disposal. Please join me in thanking Hans, Lisa, Magnus, and Mike. This has been a terrific discussion. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. <laughs> and thank and you, Attila, for organizing it. And, and please also join me in thanking the Institute for Future Studies. Colleagues have put an incredible amount of work in organizing the event. And last but not least, thank you, uh, the audience, both here and online, for joining us. And uh, just a final note, although the formal part of the conversation ended, uh, we are lucky to be here in this really nice place. So just a couple of steps uh, outside of the um, Hörsalen, uh, you can have a cup of coffee or uh, maybe a glass of wine. Um, uh, I encourage you to stay on and continue uh, the discussion if your time permits. And uh, please follow uh, both the Institute for Future Studies online uh, as well as the Stockholm Center for the Ethics of War and Peace. We also have a blog. Um, it's called Public Ethics, publicethics.org. It's philosophers, experts uh, take on current affairs. So there are so many ways to continue this discussion and I really hope we all will do in some way or another. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.